You know, we've been talking about salvation over the last several weeks and uh, certainly have put much emphasis upon that salvation is conditional based upon man's obedience, but God does want us to be saved, so he's done his part. Last week, we focused on the idea of repentance, having already studied about faith before, and we have some upcoming episodes that will focus about faith, faith even more than we already have. But this week, I want to think about the idea of confession. You've heard me on this program, if you've been watching any length of time, talk about that to take the first part of the condition that man has to execute to, to perform in his life to receive salvation is that he has to be added to the church. The only way he can be added to the church is that he has faith produced by the Word of God so that it would lead him to repent of the sins that separated him from God so that he will confess Jesus as the Son of God and be baptized. Now, oftentimes when we study confession, people have misunderstandings, and rightly so. Television often will depict it as the idea that you go into a confessional booth and you tell a man your sins, asking him to forgive you, even though that's not exactly what the scriptures teach. Others will actually talk about confession as being part of salvation, and we'll quote from verses like where it says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. And that's not exactly in context when you use it as a part of the plan of salvation. And then you have Romans chapter 10, verse 10, that talks about with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made in salvation. So it would be easy to understand how an individual can become confused when trying to figure out exactly what do, does the Bible teach about confession. Today on Have a Bible Question, we're going to answer the question, what is confession? according to Scripture. And in doing so, we're going to notice that there are different types of confession, and we want to focus in on the type of confession that can lead you to being added to the body of Jesus, henceforth being the, the confession that is able to lead you to salvation. Thank you for joining me, Guy Montgomery, for Have a Bible Question, where we search God's Word for Bible answers to your Bible questions. So we're talking about confession, and there certainly are different types of confession that you can read of in the Bible. Now, the one I quote from a lot was that with Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And this would be correct to use when you talk about the confession that needs to be made in order for one to take the steps towards obtaining the salvation that's freely offered by God. It's important that we actually just take the time and Perhaps read it in God's Word. So if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans 10. If not, it'll be on the screen for you. But we begin reading actually in verse 1 because I want to keep it in context. It says here, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to every one that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth the, those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on the wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, we see something important in this passage about Jesus. And sometimes we, we overlook this part of Romans uh, because we jump right down into verse 9 or verse 10, but we start at the beginning of the chapter because we want to keep it in context. And, and I want you to go back to right there where it said in verse 6, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Well, that's the Father. God, John 3 verse 16, sent His only Son to this world. Jesus was willing to come to offer Himself as a sacrifice, and He would be willing to die on the cross even though in the Garden of Gethsemane he had uttered the prayer, Not my will, but thine be done. The next verse, verse 7, it says, Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? 
And so after Jesus died, he was laid in the tomb, but the tomb would not be able to hold him because he would raise again. By what power was he raised? By the power of God. He does all this because he wants you to be saved. Why is this being preached? Because, uh, well, in this verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So what he's actually preaching here is Jesus Christ, him crucified, him slain. Him, he was laid in the ground, but he was raised again. By the way, this is the same message that was preached in Acts chapter 2 that we looked at last week when talking about repentance. That yes, Jesus is the Son of God. He died for our sins and the grave could not hold him. That's the gospel, the good news spoken of in Romans 1 verse 16. And so when he starts reading, when we read in verse 8, it says, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. <laughs> it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And somebody watching this said, But wait a minute. You said before on previous episodes that baptism is how you saved. I want to remind you, I've never said baptism alone saves an individual. In fact, I encourage you, go back to YouTube, find that episodes that we talked about baptism, and you will find me saying that you cannot truly be baptized for the remission of sins to obtain salvation and, uh, if you don't have faith. Baptism alone does not save. Neither does faith alone, neither does confession alone, neither does preaching alone, but all these things work together in order to save an individual. So in this case, when he's talking to the church at Rome, he's emphasizing the importance of faith produced by the Word of God to cause an individual to confess Jesus. Remember, he's dealing with people that have rejected Jesus, trying to hold on to the Old Testament law, which, which Jesus nailed to the cross. Now keep reading with me in verse 10. It says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, the individual once said that faith alone saves. What do you do with this verse? Because here's the individual that believes, but it says, confession must be made unto salvation. Now, we're going to come back to this later on in the episode because this helps us understand that all confession is not confession made to salvation. But this is the confession to be made to salvation. And he goes on, verse 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Now, I, I pause for just a moment here because a lot of people want to think that these verses stand alone, but let's go back to verse 8. He says, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith that we preach. How do they have the faith? From the preaching of the gospel. That's what he's saying here. How do people believe so that they shall call upon the name of the Lord? Through the preaching. So he goes on in verse 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings and good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed your report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So there is a confession that has to be made unto salvation. And that confession is that, yes, the Lord Jesus is the Son of God, that which the Jews so adamantly denied, and that which will keep them from being able to be saved. Stay tuned. We'll notice some more about confession after this little break. Would you like to know more about God's Word, the Bible? We would like to send you a free Bible correspondence course. You take each lesson that we mail to you and complete it at your own pace. This allows for little pressure and for God's Word to do the teaching. Upon completion, mail it back in the postage paid envelope. You then receive the next lesson in the mail. If interested, go to cocmilestone.com or call 850-479-8878. Throughout history, the path of life has been for most an unknown path. The struggle of mankind to find meaning, to know from where we came, to ultimately know where we'll end up. Questions like, is there a God? Or what would God have me to do? All these questions can have an answer if we know where to look. The Bible. 
At Milestone, we offer biblical worship, Bible classes, website resources, and more. Learn more about us at cocmilestone.com. Check out our Facebook page, or better yet, visit us in person. We've already noted that there's several different types of confession that can be made. And so the most recent one we were talking about on the program is the idea of confession unto salvation. I want to continue with that thought before going on to other types of confession that appear in the Bible as well as maybe the confusion or the types of confession that you don't read of in the Bible. And so when we think about the confession that's made unto salvation, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, we need to realize we actually not only have it being commanded and taught there, we have a great example of it in the book of Acts. If you've got your Bibles, you want to turn, we're going to go to the book of Acts and we're going to go to around chapter 8 if we can. Because in chapter 6, we actually read of a problem where the Grecian widows were being neglected. And so there was this murmuring that was taking place. Upon the apostles' instructions, they appointed seven men that were full of the Spirit, met qualifications that they could minister to those Grecian widows. We actually go on and see in the next chapter, one of those men in chapter 7 was Stephen. And he would preach. And as he went forth preaching, uh, he made some people angry. And this led to him being stoned. And we also come to chapter 8 when you have that uh, Philip was actually preaching in Samaria. And this is where you read about Simon the sorcerer. But I want to go deeper into chapter 8 down to about verse 26. And it's here that we read, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? I love this part because here is a man, the Ethiopian eunuch, that's devoted. He had been to Jerusalem to worship. He's traveling back. And what's he doing? He's still reading Scripture. He's reading from the prophet Isaiah. And such a logical question. Do you understand what you read? And the Ethiopian's answer is noticed right here in the next verse when he says, And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture that he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. Remember Romans 10? When it talks about how shall they believe unless they... Uh, have heard, how shall they hear unless it be preached? How shall it be preached unless they be sent? Now we have Philip being sent to be able to go to the Ethiopian eunuch to preach so that there can be belief. Now we backtrack that in Romans 10, that logical flow, we think about confession unto salvation. And so keep reading with me. Verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart that thou mayest. And he answered and said, Notice this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Go back to Romans 10. <laughs> he was preaching to him what? what? What confession is able to be made? It's about that Jesus is the Son of God that has been sent to this world, John 3, 16, so that he could die for our sins to be raised again. That is the great confession that needs to be made. Right here, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Why did he rejoice? Because he was saved because he was baptized. But what had to take place before the baptizing to wash away the sins, Acts 22, 16? Right here, he had to confess Jesus Christ as the Lord. So not only do we see the commandment and the teaching of it in Romans 10, we see it put into practice when it came to the Ethiopian eunuch and his conversion in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 and following. Stay tuned, and we're going to notice a different type of confession that we can read of in God's Word.
Since 1987, the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies has been providing college-level Bible classes tuition free. In fact, I myself am a graduate of the school. I'm excited to announce that we are now 100% online, offering you the opportunity to utilize these courses to help you grow in your relationship with God. You can learn more so that you can prepare yourself for the next semester at nwfsbs.com. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. So we've noticed the confession that's made unto salvation, but there's another type of confession that you can speak, um, read of in the New Testament Scriptures. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to start reading back around verse 28. Now, it's in this that chapter that Jesus is getting ready to send the apostles out on the limited commission. He's going to give them some warnings because when the gospel is being preached, and that's what's necessary to produce faith in order to lead to confessing Jesus as the Son of God. Because remember, preaching is all about the gospel, which is about Jesus and the good news. And the good news is that Jesus was sent by God in order to die for our sins, to be resurrected so that we can be called up to live in heaven with Him. That's the gospel. That's that good news. You cannot preach the gospel without preaching Jesus. And so He's sending them out, limited commission. Later on, it'll be the Great Commission in Matthew 28. But right now, it's that limited commission that He's preparing them to go out for. Now, He's going to warn them that there's going to be opposition which isn't unusual. Every time people have preached the message of God, when you look through Scripture, there is opposition that is met. And so he's kind of building them up, so to speak. And we pick up reading in verse 28. He says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, if we just read there, that's it's kind of negative right there. It would be kind of fearful uh, that there is someone that can kill both body and soul in hell. But look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, as a youngster, this kind of verse kind of scared me, because what this verse tells me is that God is watching everything, and I didn't always do as I was supposed to do as a youngster. And so when I was doing wrong, I thought about that all-seeing eye up there that's seeing that, and it would always intimidate me. Um, sometimes not enough, because thinking about that should have kept me from doing wrong. But this verse isn't about fear right here. It's about comfort. Because he's saying if there's two sparrows and one dies, God knows it. In fact, the very number of hairs on your head, now to some of us that's more than others, but he knows the number of hairs on your head. And what's interesting about that is it's always changing, isn't it? But God knows you. He, he knows what's going on in your life. And so he goes on to the next verse that says, uh, fear ye not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, but I came, to send, but I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, in this passage, the confession is being willing to preach Jesus. In context, he's telling them, don't be fearful of people that can kill the body. <laughs> That's just temporary because they can take your life away, but if you're in Christ, you live forever. And, and, and God's there to take care of you. So don't be fearful of those things, but be willing to confess, teach, profess Him through your actions in life. Be willing to live for Jesus. And if you do, He'll be willing to confess you come judgment day before the Father. Stay tuned. There's a third type of confession that Christians need to make. We'll notice that in just a moment. When I study God's Word, it amazes me how many references there are to scientific things. But sometimes I struggle with that because I'm not always the best in science. That's why I'm thankful for Apologetics Press. They produce materials from Bibles to books to children's material that helps us as Christians to be able to understand how God's Word and science relate. I want to encourage you to go check them out at their website, apologeticspress.org. See them today. So we've noticed two types of confession that the Bible speaks of. 
There's the type of confession that is unto salvation. Then there's the confessing in the sense that we will live our life and not be afraid to teach and preach the gospel and live the gospel in front of others. The third type that the Bible speaks of is one that's kind of misconstrued at times, but it's a very important part of confession. We read of this in James chapter 5 and verse 16. I'll back up just a little bit to set it in context. We begin reading in verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now here we're being encouraged to confess your faults one to another. I kept it in context because in James, especially in the closing end of this, he's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to the church. So it's the, the, these are people that have already confessed Jesus for the purpose of unto salvation. Uh, it's also not the living here because he's talking about to each other. This confession is literally confessing your faults. Now, we all have faults. We have shortcomings. And being a Christian doesn't take away the idea that we will still err. Uh, you know, think about what we were talking about earlier. I, I just made a brief mention that Philip had preached in Samaria and Simon the sorcerer ha had been converted and right after his conversion, he actually messes up because what happens is he wants to buy the power that the apostles had because he saw it was true compared to his false deceiving he had been doing for the people. But that sin of covetousness, that fault that he had, he wasn't rid of yet. And so he was rebuked for this, and he actually told them that he was, uh, he expressed his sorrow, his repentance, and he because he was already a Christian, had already been baptized, he was told just to pray for forgiveness. That's what James is talking about. You have faults, confess them to each other. Now, it doesn't say priest. I realize there's a misnomer out there that is often conveyed when you watch television and you have people going into confessional booths and they go to a man that they call father, say, Father, forgive me, even though the... Scripture does not set any precedent for us calling men here on this earth father uh, the, uh, in the sense of a spiritual father. Uh, we certainly understand from the New Testament that all Christians technically are priests with Christ being our high priest. But this is just a brother to brother, sister to sister, confessing their faults and praying for one another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You don't need a confessional booth. You don't need a man that wears a collar. You don't read of that in the Bible. You just need a Christian that you are helping each other along through this world. Hebrews 10 talks about provoking one another unto love and good works and numerous passages that we as Christians edify each other. I remember as a youngster, we uh, bought a building that once was used uh, for, a, for a religious organization that they had the practice of confessional booths. And, and we found it humorous as youngsters, as kids, to go in there and, and play confessional. But, uh, brethren, we don't need to play confessional. We don't need to uh, make it somehow that uh, we are practicing something that God's Word doesn't teach. The power that is found in confessing our faults is the strength that we have from one another for the encouragement, for the admonishment, for praying for each other that all Christians can do. It's really a shame that more people don't do this. If we can acknowledge our fault and we can pray for each other, we can then strengthen and encourage. Think about it in this regard. If you have somebody that's an alcoholic, they are encouraged through the AA program that they have got to acknowledge their problem. They have to first be able to introduce themselves and say their name and say, I am an alcoholic. Why? Because to deal with their problem, they first have to recognize the problem. The same is true with our faults when we fall short of God. If we're having a problem with covetousness, if we're having a problem of uh, any difficulty in life, not loving somebody, we're uh, having a problem with bitterness, if we can confess our fault to our brethren, we have prayer to, to ask God for forgiveness and strength, then we as brethren can encourage each other. 
let us make sure we confess our faults one to another, as we have noticed here in James chapter 5, verse 16. Do you ever get confused when studying the Bible on your own, but you feel uncomfortable or lost studying in a large group? Or perhaps you don't have the time to commit to a regular scheduled Bible class, but you still hunger and thirst for the Word of God? Then try our free online Bible course from the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies. These classes provide a clear, concise, and thorough Bible study in the comfort of your own home. You take the course on your schedule and at your own pace. Sign up today at courses.nwfsbs.org or learn more about Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies at nwfsbs.org. So today we've been answering the question, what is confession? We've, we've tried to make sure we answer this with a Bible answer to your Bible question so that we know what God says, not what man says regarding this. We've noticed three types of confession that the Bible speaks of. First, a confession that's made unto salvation, Romans 10, verses 9 and verse 10. And this is exactly what the Ethiopian eunuch did. The second type is a confession that you make when you live for Christ and are willing to proclaim Him as you go throughout the world spreading His gospel. The third type is as a Christian, when you have failings, when you have faults, when you sin, that you are willing to confess that to other faithful brethren for their prayers, for their admonition, and their encouragement. I encourage you, don't be like we were as children playing confession but be serious about the confessions that you need to make in your life. If you need help confessing Christ as the Son of God so that you can be baptized, contact us. We'll be happy to put you in touch with a body of believers, a part of the Church of Christ that we read of in the New Testament in your area. And you can be sure to confess Jesus as the Son of God and put Him on in baptism. Make sure that you tune in next week as we continue to search God's Word for Bible answers to your Bible questions. In a world of religious division and biblical misunderstanding, it is very easy to be confused about what God would have us to do. Join Guyton Montgomery each Sunday morning on this station for Have a Bible Question. Expect to receive a Bible answer to your Bible question. Thank you for watching Have a Bible Question, brought to you by the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies and the Church of Christ at Milestone. Visit our websites at nwfsbs.org or cocmilestone.com. Thank you for your interest in Have a Bible Question. If you would like to contact us with a comment or question, you can visit our website at haveabiblequestion.com. You can email us at questions at haveabiblequestion.com. Or if you would prefer to write a letter, you can write us at Have a Bible Question in care of the Church of Christ at Milestone, 4051 Stefani Road, Cantonment, Florida, 32533. Don't hide.